Hello, it's uh, nice to see you again. My name is Dan Brook. Uh, I'm a retired clergy and academic here in Hudson. And this is another in the series of Different Voices, Shared Visions. It's a program that we've had now for almost a decade that points out that uh, even though we come from different backgrounds, uh, different locations, different ideologies, uh, in most cases, uh, most of what we share is the same rather than different. And the whole purpose of uh, our coming to you this evening is to reaffirm the fact that uh, we have much more in common and much more to talk about in terms of things we share than the things that separate us. Nonetheless, here we are at the end of 2019. As we do this, we're about a week away from the Christian holiday of uh, Christmas. Hanukkah's coming. Uh, the Muslim community has had their major celebrations about 30 days ago, uh, but the holiday spirit is among us uh, uh, and uh, gearing up almost every day. Nonetheless, as we look at the year 2019, I think we'd have to say that it's been a kind of a tumultuous year as we come to the close of it. I think as we try to look at what's going on in the planet, I kind of like to think of it in terms of the social institutions uh, on our small globe. A social institution is the way humans tend to organize their lives in terms of meeting uh, human needs. And so wherever you live on this planet, generally there are five social institutions that the people have come together uh, to organize in a manner of meeting uh, these human needs. And it includes politics and economics and family and religion and education. And so in preparation for this, I did just a little uh, reviewing of 2019 to see how well the social institutions uh, on our small and shared planet uh, have accomplished uh, their goals this year. Politically, of course, in the United States, we're just on the verge of uh, uh, an impeachment of a president. Scientifically, we are inching ever closer to the terminus of climate change. Financially, our economic inequalities are growing still. Socially, we continue to separate ourselves from one another. Reli religiously, we continue to be less interested in religion and more exclusive with regard to the religions we hold. In terms of family, it was surprising, but not so much to learn that the U.S. now has the world's highest rate of children living in single family homes. And educationally, teacher pay continues to fall and educational disparity between states continues to grow. So all in all, we have quite a bit of mischief in the world right now, and also in our own culture. And the purpose of getting together tonight is to talk about how our faith impacts our ability to deal with the kind of unrest, personal, civil, that we see throughout the world, and especially in our own uh, uh, country and in our own locations. And the people that uh, we are delighted to have here to share some conversation about that, I'll have, you introduce, have them introduce themselves to you shortly. One is a Christian young woman born in the heartland of the U.S., uh, Nebraska. The other is a Muslim young woman born in, of all places, Texas of the U.S., <laughs> And uh, together they share insights that I know you will find uh, meaningful. Uh, before I have them introduce themselves, I want them, when they do, to uh, make a comment about what uh, the former President Obama <clears throat> said just a couple of days ago at an international conference. He was asked about the role of women in our culture, especially with regard to politics. And he said, in his judgment, women are... Uh, how did she, he say it? Anyway, much better equipped for leadership roles than males. And if we would just elect female leaders, 
to all to be heads of government throughout the world in two years they would turn everything around and accomplish a much more than the typical male accomplishes now I, i'm interested in seeing how they might uh, react to that so why don't we start with uh, the young uh, woman who was born in of all places houston texas okay. <laughs> texas is a heartland of some type but <laughs> it's more of a heartland of cattle but uh, <laughs> so thank you dan for the question um yeah and you know i i think that that is a really great statement um and that in the context of our times i feel like because there is so much uh in equity in amongst um you know folks who are women who are, you know, in leadership versus, you know, men who are in leadership, I would say that I agree that there need to be more opportunities for women to reach leadership positions. I wholeheartedly um, believe that that is something that is only going to lead to better results in so many different sectors like nonprofit, government, right, private sector we can think of. Um, and I think, you know, from a spiritual perspective and from a religious perspective, there's nothing within the Islamic faith tradition that would hold women back from pursuing any of that type of leadership. Um, in fact, within Islamic history, both, um, you know, from a scholarly perspective as well as just from a, you know, political perspective as well, there's been a whole host of examples that we can provide of women leaders. You know, you can think of Indonesia and Pakistan and so many different countries that have already had female heads of state who are from majority Muslim countries, right? And so it is really, um, it's kind of fascinating to me that we haven't you know, seen in our political institutions and systems the same type of, of leadership and the same level of leadership. Um, but I absolutely think that, you know, given the context of our time, it's really important to think about gender parity when it comes to things like leadership. <coughs> Now, would you mind telling us your name and a little about yourself? Yes. Oh, <laughs> and I completely dove in. So my name is Naima Khan, and I am a board member of the Islamic Resource Group, which is a small uh, nonprofit speakers bureau based in the Twin Cities area. And we provide information about Islam and the Muslim community to those who are interested and open to learning accurate information about our community. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Nebraska. I have never had that title, but <laughs> I feel like you should wear your sash. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll get a crown next time too. Uh, yeah. So my name is Kendra Grams. Uh, I am the pastor at First Presbyterian Church here in Hudson, and I was born and raised in Nebraska, also with lots of cattle. Yes. Um, and what would I add to Naima's very thoughtful response? I would, I, I guess, just echo what she said, that I think um, there is a need for parity. I think there just is also a broader need for recognizing uh, the unique gifts and perspectives that women can bring that I do think would be transformational uh, to all aspects of, of leadership within this country and around the world. Um, but just having women in places of power is not in and of itself going to change everything, mm. um, I think. So also recognizing that just because we elect a female leader or you have a female pastor, does, that's not a sign that we've overcome inequity either. Um, so being mindful that we're on a journey and then at every moment looking for those people who are embodying the best of who, who humanity can be um, and the diverse gifts that we all have and that it's only by working together and using everyone's gifts uh, that we'll get hopefully uh, to the place where, that I believe God desires for us of, of equity and justice and, and peace and safety for all. Um, you know, so we definitely need more women to do that, but we need everybody to work together to do that too. So, well said. Yeah. Well, I, um, <clears throat> of course, I've lived with five women. I have a, a spouse and four daughters, and uh, I think uh, one of the most 
troublesome things I ever had to do was to write a chapter on a book uh, on the church's role in basically their uh, misogynist behavior mm. over the centuries, not decades, but centuries, and how long the church, the Christian church, I don't know about the Islamic uh, community, mm. has uh, not through its belief system, but uh, through the people who have uh, had leadership roles, all male, uh, we would now call it uh, sort of pivoting from the truth to a reality uh, that they want that maintains power and uh, uh, among other things and how, how harmful that has been over the years. And my thought has always been how long will it take to overturn centuries of practice mm. that are really diametric, diametrically opposed to the theologies, the beliefs that that we are really supposed to stand for. So I hope it'll be fast, mm -hmm. faster. Now the topic of our conversation tonight is in, this, in these holiday times, particularly this holiday, while uh, we are, have high expectations for peace, love, joy, all the good emotional responses that the human condition uh, loves, uh, are always tempered with just the reverse, that for the many highs, for many families, there are lows that are just as low, if not lower. In fact, the parish I go to started a few years ago having a special uh, a, a religious ceremony, worship service, uh, for those who are down, depressed, and uh, hurt in mm -hmm. this time of the year. So what role do our faiths play in uh, in addressing some of the upset, uh, disgust, hurts of our time. You want me to dive in? <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, well, one thought I have, um, obviously being in the midst as a Christian pastor of the, the Christian season and uh, my parish, like uh, many but not all Christian traditions, takes the weeks before that to celebrate Advent or a time of preparation for the coming of, of Christ and some of the traditional themes of those Sundays are exactly what you said, joy, peace, uh, love, hope. Um, so it's a really interesting context to just juxtapose that with, with the state of our world where geopolitically there's a lot going on. Uh, but as you said, there's uh, lots of ups and downs to life. Um, everything from people experiencing loss of loved ones to um, marriages, losing a marriage, losing a job, um, getting a diagnosis that just kind of shatters everything you thought you knew. Um, so it is a time to think a lot about how do we not get mired down in that. Uh, and I also have, um, I think, the good fortune of being in conversation with people in the wider world that do not claim a religious faith. And one thing I've realized is that as the problems seem to get bigger or at least feel weightier uh, to me, my faith becomes more and more important to me. Because um, to me, it's claiming hope that my, my hope, my Christian hope, isn't based on like hoping for some sports team to win or something. It's, it's, it's not a situational thing. It's, it's much bigger based on the promises of my faith um, that God is making the world new. God is constantly pursuing um, justice and peace and love and you know in my faith tradition that's embodied through Jesus Christ but it's part of the the story of faith from the beginning of time um, and then that's a sure promise so I don't know when this this shining dream that God has will be fully realized but it will be and we're on that path and so there's this sense that while I have this sliver and my call is to do everything I can right now. It is also a much bigger thing that 
I'm, I can't do it all, but I can do my part and I can trust uh, in my faith in the God that I call upon, that God is doing God's part, <laughs> the bigger part. And, and that has been super important to me. I, as I said, people of no faith kind of look at me and are like, how do you? And I increasingly realize it's because I just so deeply feel that. And that helps me keep going. That even if I'm not agreeing with this politician or that politician and I feel like everything is going or, or all of my friends are having everything go poorly, <laughs> that there's still this bigger picture and I'm still held by that bigger love of God. Um, and so that keeps me centered at least on the journey. Wow, but so much rich stuff there. It's uh, absolutely um, so, so similar. Um, and I think that the way that faith helps in tumultuous times is, you know, I, I think allowing us the ability to, to take a step back a little bit, right? And, and to kind of contextualize how limited our knowledge and our, our you know, understanding of things can be. And um, really help us kind of understand that there is a broader picture and at a very like I guess granular level for within the Muslim faith tradition specifically I think our faith really helps us detach ourselves or learn to detach ourselves more from our egos right so many of the issues that we face when it comes to as often you know thinking of like family disputes or you know all the classic like the myriad of challenges that every family every community faces right it's um i think a lot of the animus that we tend to create within ourselves within communities can sometimes be heavily related to a lot of us having a hard time letting go of our egos um, and i think that often that is what it boils down to and so I think the, the benefit of having a faith that, you know, such as we do, that calls us to, to really tying ourselves to a higher power and a higher purpose is that we're able to say, okay, we're actually in this for something greater than ourselves, right? And it helps, it helps me so much to, to think, okay, now that I have that framing, I'm able to say, well, what's really my role here, right? And what is my intention? And I think the Islamic faith uh, places such a primacy on that intention piece that our actions are, are really valued and judged, you know, in the eyes of God ultimately by our intentions. And so we, we really use that as a constant way or, or we try to, <laughs> to keep a check on ourselves of saying, you know, what is my intention and what is my role in the space and how can I really be um, a, a piece of serving the, the will of God and, and really kind of doing my best to, you know, let go of those things that might serve my ego well and feel good in the short term, but in the longer term create problems that, you know, are probably not better for our family, our community, etc. Right? So that's a little bit of what I see the role of faith as kind of that check on ourselves as well. You know, um, I'm going to turn the tables on you guys a little bit and ask you to try to define in your own mind what role your particular religion has played in making matters worse rather than better mm -hmm. when it comes to we as members of uh, the same race, human race, uh, not get along very well. <laughs> Where to begin? <laughs> you know, right? That's such a big... <laughs> uh, you know, <clears throat> that's absolutely true. I think in any process of moving forward, being honest about the past and the warts or cancers, to use that metaphor, of the past that are still festering in some way that were never fully dealt with, uh, certainly as the Christian church. <laughs> it's a long list. Uh, you know, historically, uh, we can talk about the Crusades. That's a big one. Uh, you know, we didn't, weren't exactly loving and welcoming of people that were unlike ourselves and fostered lots of sentiments that 
have cascaded down through the centuries. Um, you know, I think of uh, my own denomination more recently, the history of this country. Certainly the Presbyterian Church was complicit in um, supporting slavery, in uh, supporting the um, almost complete genocide of certain indigenous populations and complete genocide of certain indigenous peoples in this country. Um, so that legacy lives on in so many ways that we have yet uh, to fully acknowledge, let alone begin the work of repairing the damage uh, that we have done. Um, and and it's, it's critical work. I mean, as a Christian, we are called to reconciliation and part of reconciliation um, and, and repair and is, is being honest. Um, you know, there are things that we don't do in the Bible, like Jubilee, like returning land to original. We don't do that. It's in there. But I know of very few even slivers of anything close to that um, happening. So um, all these ways in which we've, we've sown difference and um, most of it goes back to power, wanting to have power over and so then using whatever we can to justify it. Um, whether it's a faithful reading of, of our religious text or not, um, we have wielded um, religious texts and religious institutions, um, Christian uh, ones, to do just, just great harm. And we have, we have to be honest about that to be able to go forward, I think. Um, not to get anybody's guilt up, um, but to be truly honest about where that is and how that has impacted us uh, even today, to today. So I guess that's where I'd start, but that's only the very tip of the iceberg. <laughs> uh, thank you, that's, that was so deep. Um, and I appreciate your words, Kendra. Um, you know, I would say that we, we like to make the distinction, right, that Islam is, for Muslims, the, our, the God's will of how people ought to live their lives on earth, right? And that is the ideal. So we like to make the distinction between the idea and the teachings and the ideals of Islam mm -hmm. versus Muslims, right? And as, as any community, we all have our shortcomings. And we feel that in different ways, um, you know, in different parts of the world, people who miss, who actually don't, they, they, it's, it's not maybe even a willing misinterpretation rather than a lack of understanding period of the religious teachings will bar women, for example, from getting education and claim that that is based on any kind of faith uh, teaching, right? Which is absurd to the mainstream understanding of Muslims, right? Um, and then you have, um, you know, folks who, I think folks tend to call people fundamentalists, but the irony of that term is that they don't even really understand the fundamentals <laughs> of the teaching of their faith because, you know, these folks will cherry pick verses from the Quran. They will cherry pick ideas from our tradition in order to justify their social, political, you know, means really. and. Um, and that's unfortunate. It leads to unnecessary loss of lives. Killing of innocent people is by far the most, one of the most heinous crimes that one can commit within the faith of Islam. And yet we have so many people claiming to act on behalf of Islamic this and that, right? And yet if you look at the majority of the people who they, who they murder are among the Muslim community. And so you, you have to kind of take that and, and hold, you know, the irony there and kind of really wonder, are these folks truly acting in a way that's faith inspired and that, you know, is derived from the teaching of their traditions? Um, and so I feel like, you know, in different ways, we, we face similar struggles where often the, um, again, I, I, I have a particular view on this, but the egos and the, the, uh, the selfish nature of, you know, Muslims, right, will get us into trouble because um, there's a lack of, of honesty to the faith there and intellectual honesty that is happening when people 
cherry pick and try and distort the religious teachings for, for their own goals. Just uh, again as another aside, as a Muslim woman, uh, fairly young, have you seen a ch change in the community around you in the USA uh, over the last years? And if so, uh, how has it affected you? And how do you feel generally it's affected at least the Muslim community of which you're aware, being a Muslim in the United States at this time mm -hmm. with a so-called Muslim ban, mm -hmm. all the uh, media out there that uh, mm -hmm. denigrates people of all varieties, particularly and including Muslims. Mm -hmm. How has this affected you and the people you know? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. It's a, it's a big question. And you know, I can speak from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I was 16 when the 9-11 attacks happened. Mm -hmm. And so I actually remember growing up in an America that more or less was not obsessed <laughs> with this idea of a violent kind of um, identity being tied to my faith identity, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so it, it's this really interesting kind of existence, really, um, because the first half of my life or so, I really didn't face a lot of the challenges that young Muslims that, you know, we look at today, uh, there's so much research out there that mm -hmm. talks about the stigmas that young Muslim students face in mm -hmm. schools with bullying and, and et cetera, right? And I feel like they just face such a unique set of challenges that I'm, you know, I pray for them. <laughs> and I, I don't know what I would have done if I had to face those same stigmas growing mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but absolutely, I mean, after I graduated high school, after I got into college, in fact, one of my, my undergraduate thesis statement was, was a study in communications on just how much the media was using um, different buzzwords and, and key terms in reporting on Muslims uh, globally. Um, and it was really fascinating because you can't find one uh, pattern throughout the use of Mm -hmm. of uh, distorted kind of concepts in the media, except that they tend to fall on election cycles. Mm -hmm. The, the anti-Muslim mm -hmm. rhetoric spikes more when there's an election cycle that's happening, which I think we saw clearly in 2016 mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so it is a different reality. I mean, it's, it's different to have to have a fear in the back of your head that, oh, in any space that I go into, are there people that will take my hijab, for example? in the wrong way, right? Like, are there people who, the mere act of covering my hair and displaying um, what I think is a duty within my faith might be interpreted as me being hostile to their values, right? Um, which is, it's, it's a scary thing to have to carry with you um, a lot. It's, it becomes tiring. Um, I remember I used to work at this this nonprofit and a former job, and um, you know that we had a bunch of donors, you know, kind of coming to an event, and you know, I was I all of a sudden kind of grew conscious, and it was like the beginning of the event, and people were starting to filter in, and I was like, oh gosh, I wonder if people will look at my hijab and think certain things, or be less motivated to donate to our organization. And I remember my colleague, who is who is a middle-aged white woman um, at the time, she she was she turned to me and she goes. I've never had to think about that. And, and so, you know, to me, I think that it's th thoughts like those kind of stay with you and in your head, regardless of how conscious you are of them at any given time. And so it's just like the reality of kind of moving in that. And yet knowing that, you know, um, for many of us, uh, for, for me at least in the Muslim community, I have so many privileges yet, right, uh, relative to, to so many other people. And so um, it's really kind of holding those realities and, and knowing that while I, I do tend to move in many privileged spaces and, uh, you know, I, I, I have so many folks who are, you know, within the community and outside of the community that are so curious and loving and, and hold such compassion for our communities all at the same time. And yet there's this very real like fear-based like aspect of like, oh, am I going to get called out or am I going to get physically harmed or jumped or, you know, I don't know, mugged or whatever it is, right? You hear so many news stories about students and 
older women and, you know, people just being unfortunately shot and like ran over. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a very like, it's kind of a dualized, like you have to just learn to navigate spaces with withholding all of that. So I guess that is my easiest way of answering that. How long have Muslims been in the United States? Since the birth of the nation, <laughs> really. Um, so I believe that, um, you know, and of course historians always dispute facts, but um, I believe that folks who were sent with, you know, Columbus on, on the voyage, right, are, were Muslim, like they navigated here, were Muslim. Um, and about, you know, roughly a third of the people who were in ca captured and enslaved um, you know, and brought here from Africa identified as Muslims. And so I think people often don't realize, I mean, even here in Minnesota, the historical record shows that as early as 1880s, the late 1880s, early 1890s, we had people coming in from Lebanon, from Syria, trades people who came here to, you know, earn a, earn a living and, uh, and make their future here in Minnesota. And so it's, it's really kind of fascinating when you think about the modern political discourse and how long the Muslim community here mm -hmm. exists. So. Yeah. And I dovetail on something uh, you said. I think it, it's, first of all, thank you for sharing so beautifully just your experience yeah, to help course. us all under understand more uh, what our, our Muslim neighbors face on a daily basis. I appreciate it also how beautifully you nuanced privilege even within your own community yeah. and, and talking about fear because that's one thing I, I think is part of the challenge of, of the times we face is um, yes everybody faces challenges and sometimes we put up these barriers of oh well I I don't have space or for whatever reason I can't have compassion for the particular challenges that the Muslim community is facing because I I'm having these challenges over here, whether it's um, because of gender or class uh, or whatever it is, right? We, we tend to default towards this either or, you know, a duality and, and instead of trying to, I think, live out of the abundance that God intends that, that there's n enough space for all, there's enough for all. and listening with compassion and having compassion to another person's, the particular challenges they face, does not negate in any way the particular challenges I face or my child faces or my neighbor faces, right? Um, we tend to put up the fear <laughs> instead of leading with compassion that yes, my challenges are real and other people also have challenges. And so I just wanted to affirm that as I think um, a wonderful thing that we could all do better at, <laughs> you know, listening with compassion Absolutely. to others, trusting their, their experience to be fully authentic and fully valid, and that that in no way negates our own, whatever it is. So just living from that generosity, which, which I think is a, across all of our faiths too. You know, I know it's certainly part of the Christian faith and from all my other interfaith neighbors, that's what I've heard. So um, that would maybe be a hopeful place that would help us if we could practice that discipline of listening with compassion and really accepting and trusting everybody's authentic sharing of their own experience. I think it'd get us a long ways. <laughs> the, um, just to go back a bit, to pick on you a little bit. Okay. <laughs> it's not really that. <clears throat> I recently came back from, <clears throat> excuse me, spending a few weeks in uh, Victoria, British Columbia mm -hmm. with a daughter and family and visited uh, on a couple of Sundays the church they go to, which is an Anglican church. And um, at the beginning of both services, the priest uh, started out with a statement of thanks uh, for the two Aboriginal tribes who lived on the land that the church now sits on, uh, asking for forgiveness 
for uh, all that uh, the so-called settlers did uh, to the aboriginals uh, and uh, trying to make amends and uh, what they're trying to do and wanting every week to remember that their placement there is, is based on the harm they have done to these two aboriginal uh, tribes. And then they always list the programs that they have in place for uh, trying to address some of these things. And it just struck me, if we, as you suggest, want to start to overcome some of the, uh, some of the most unfortunate mischief that all faiths have been involved in over the years to the detriment of others, it really takes hard and consistent work. What would happen to a typical Christian congregation if a clergy would stand up on a Sunday morning and start their service by saying, we are here this morning <laughs> just to recognize that the Ojibwe originally owned this land. Yeah. What do you think would happen? Uh, it's a great question um, and one that uh, my own uh, church family is, is actually wrestling with, I think, pretty actively recently. I mentioned that Presbyterians at least were complicit in these huge racial um, parts of the history of our country. Uh, so it does take the long haul. Um, and, and that sort of, of land acknowledgement can be very meaningful. I'm glad to hear that the congregation you're referencing clearly partnered it with ongoing active uh, work <laughs> of, of repair and, and reconciliation and didn't just acknowledge it and stop there um, because that's not enough. Um, you know, it's a first step. So doing that well, standing up, it, it absolutely can be a first step is acknowledging uh, that history <laughs> that whatever this ground is that we are currently standing on in the United States, it was taken from someone. <laughs> usually forcibly or by deceit, <laughs> you know, by a treaty broken at some point. Um, so starting there and then reaching out to make connections with our indigenous brothers and sisters who are still here and seeking to have um, vital communities uh, and being in partnership with them, not pretending we have the answers to now centuries of wrongs, um, but really working with them. One of the things that um, I've been encouraged by um, is my own denomination is now looking at as we see some churches closing their doors and consolidating um, there are economic assets there from the sale of buildings. Um, so there's actually starting to be conversations about what would it look like to just give this land back, period, or give some of the money from the sale of real estate mm. back. You know, it's not the land, uh, but it's something. So conversations are starting to happen, I think, in the larger church. Um, and every congregation, I think, is at a different place <laughs> of how they would receive um, some of those acknowledgments and the work to build um, bridges that truly do foster repair work and, and seek uh, the good of indigenous communities as, as they would choose for themselves. Um, so like any, anything worth doing, um, you got to be in it for the long haul. <laughs> yeah. That reminds me, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe five years ago, a book was written about um, capitalism in the U.S. Uh, and one of the major overarching themes was that uh, it was started essentially by Muslims from Turkey. Hmm and uh, Jews from Eastern Europe. 
that our whole capitalistic background, which we kind of always assume is white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant, mm -hmm. is actually mm. uh, Muslim and Jewish. Definitely. And, uh, and that both communities have been here, as you have mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, from the beginning. Yes. What role, do you have any idea of what role uh, the Muslim community over the last 250 years has played in some of the more negative parts of the American history in terms of how we've treated indigenous people or others? Hmm, um, that is a good question. I, you know, I feel like everybody is complicit at some degree mm -hmm. to the systems of dominant culture you know, just being considered as the norm or like just being the accepted kind of standard. Um, so I certainly don't think any community is kind of scot-free, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. um, so from that angle and perspective, you know, to the extent that we have participated mm -hmm. in systems throughout mm -hmm. history that have mm -hmm. continued to exclude indigenous mm -hmm. folks, for example, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we have been complicit in that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, you know, it's an. I think it's an interesting critique of maybe you know the uh, the role that Muslims and perhaps the Jewish community uh, played in. In um, that's the first I've heard of of really kind of bringing about the capitalist system mm -hmm. because you know when you when you take uh, economics at Georgetown like I did mm -hmm. for a semester I didn't go to Georgetown but I was mm -hmm. there. Um, you know, they, they teach you about Adam Smith and the invisible yeah. hand yes, in the yes, markets yes, yes. and all the theories yes. that kind of predated, right, for, uh, in, the, uh, in that era. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so uh, that's, that's kind of the first that I've heard in, mm -hmm. in terms of that uh, mm -hmm. academically. But no, but I think, I think you know, for, for all communities, I think the, the very real question is how do we currently participate, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. in, in these different um, systemic inequalities that happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you think about the education gap, right? Mm -hmm. Like what, what role are we playing mm -hmm. in uh, demanding that our students, for example, get a certain type of, mm -hmm. you know, schooling or, or, mm -hmm. or, you know, so so I think there are very real factors that mm -hmm. communities may not mm -hmm. understand, mm -hmm. you know, how they're playing into. Um, but it's not always that neat and clean. It's not like Muslims, just like any other, you know, faith group. We're not one monolithic, mm -hmm. you know. So, for example, um, I was recently watching a show about how there were a group of South Asian parents who were not who were wanting to um, take away affirmative action from um, kind of college ha decision making so selection processes mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, because they were concerned that the South Asian students mm -hmm. would get weeded mm -hmm. out, for mm -hmm. example, right? And mm -hmm. you have this like, well, that's not really a part of any South Asian faith, <laughs> like, right? Like, it's not, and, but, but you soon understand that it's, it's really a political issue and it's an issue of resources and where people think that they're afraid of, you know, losing resources, right? And so I feel like we have many examples that we can, you know, list and, and highlight um, where communities are complicit in those yeah. types of issues, absolutely. Well, I've just noted how quickly the time has passed. <laughs> And I wonder, before we close it off for the day, if we could have each of you sort of close it off with a, uh, a thought that will raise our spirits a little <laughs> in a season where our spirits are expected to be a little higher than some of our conversations uh, have, have led us to believe. So I'll give each of you, or ask each of you, uh, as you are willing to give a closing thought. You know, I, I actually like, I, I think that um, it's funny, one of my sisters, <laughs> we, we talk about, you know, politics and all these intense topics, and she's like, so what have we solved today? Like, what, <laughs> what, are, what are we doing now that, that is going to help us build solutions to all these things that we talked about? And, you know, I, for some reason tonight, you know, I'm feeling the strain of optimism. It's really rare that actually I feel <laughs> so I'll just ride this one out <laughs> as it comes. But I think that this is part of our process, right? Humans, um, for as long as we've had civilizations, we get together. We, we figure out how to create things that are larger than ourselves. We figure out how to solve problems. And that's who we are by nature, I think, where we, we truly are problem solvers. And, and we sure we have different takes on it and different, you know, 
uh, perspectives that we come from and lenses. And I think that's the current conversation that we're having right now, right, is how are we becoming truly inclusive of all those different lenses and, and sharing ownership with all those different perspectives. And I think that there's so much to, to actually hope for. Um, I think our faiths fundamentally teach us messages of hope and being assured that there is a greater plan and that God is always working toward justice. Um, I think that manifests in different ways for our faith community and the fact that we can, the three of us can have a conversation like this tonight here, just, I don't know, it gives me, it gives me hope that we can actually get toward better understanding and better working of solutions with one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think just dovetailing off of that, um, I think a hopeful place is that people of all faiths, and I think this is true as I, I try to um, build bridges across all of Christianity, um, including with those in the Christian faith who think I, as uh, a woman, have zero business being a pastor, let alone outside the home, right? Mm -hmm. um, as I have those conversations, as I have interfaith conversations, I think being the blessing of talking with people of faith, especially, uh, is that there are deep convictions and that if we can come with with clarity about what is, is core to what we believe um, and share that authentically, then there are these beautiful points of connection just in the spirit of this program, right? Um, and that we can start there, right? So as Naima just said, that God is always working towards justice. I would say the same, right? So that fertile ground for us to work together and be problem solvers, just as, just as you said, um, is absolutely a place of hope. I mean, that's where we can grow together and, and hopefully create, um, you know, with God's guidance and leading, um, this world of peace and justice and inclusive love uh, where we take the abundance God has given and, and truly make sure all can enjoy uh, the place that God intends for them that is hopeful and wonderful. So. Um, yeah, I think that's, conversations like this give me hope because I think they're based on that fertile ground of what do we have in common instead of dwelling endlessly on what's different. Um, so. so there you have it. What a great ending to a, a conversation that I hope is informative and uh, interesting to you. and. What a delight it is, especially for somebody like myself from the generation I come from, to see two young women who are so informed, so engaged, and so hopeful about the future. And so as we uh, continue uh, in the holiday season, we surely hope that each of you in your own way has a, a wonderful time, uh, predominantly uh, demonstrating a period of peace, justice, uh, uh, joy, forgiveness, and love. Those are the things to which uh, all of us uh, commend you, trusting in the promises of God to provide it. So a blessed holiday season to you all, and thank you so much for walking, watching. Goodbye now. <laughs>